or objects using new materials. The growing consensus around the world is that a preservation philosophy is preferable to that of reconstruction. Here's an example of preservation. Note that the buildings and the objects on the left are, are left as they were with very minimal intervention. And here's an example of reconstruction. These sections of the Great Wall are built entirely new without any of the original materials, artistry, or character. To conclude our look at philosophy, let's consider some common standards by which preservation and strengthening projects are guided. Standards are critical to making sure that preservation and strengthening is done properly and carefully and intelligently. Without them, our cultural and architectural heritage would be at the whim of individuals who may not understand or care about protecting the places of historical significance. In the United States, we have the Secretary of the Interior Standards, which was created by the U.S. government to ensure that historic constructions are dealt with appropriately. These standards include a special section on historic masonry. It is basically, however, a suggestion and do not have, does not have the power of law.
There are a number of other threats that also exist. Water permeation is one that uh, many of these buildings have in common. Another is uh, failing of contiguous components, such as wood or steel. Steel, for instance, will fail over time due to corrosion. Now let's consider what we should do, or what we should be concerned about when preserving a building. One of the most important things to remember is that any new materials introduced, such as rail or steel, need to be compatible and sympathetic to the original host wall. Materials should have similar porosity, capillary water absorption, water vapor permeability, and mechanical properties. For example, in historic masonry, stainless steel is often used because it resists corrosion. And when attempting to strengthen a wall, a preservation team should consider the original characteristics of the hose and design accordingly. This will help promote future stability. When preserving, we should also consider long-term functionality. Problems like water infiltration, cracks and openings, internal voids can compromise a structure's functionality and lead to a more rapid structural decline. These threats to functionality are often caused through poor compatibility of materials that are introduced. Exterior bracing or banding, as we see here, is generally not effective, nor is it very aesthetically pleasing. Carefully placed internal repairs can make the structure more robust without changing its appearance. surrounding a masonry problem while minimizing any damaging intervention. 
intervention. The data from these NDE tests help to guide the design and repair and restoration projects and also ensures that those project goals are met when any work is finished. The state-of-the-art tool used today is micro microwave radar. It's a very powerful technique that we use on many of our projects. Sometimes it is called ground penetrating radar or GPR. Here a portable radar unit is being used. These units have been developed in recent years and they allow us a method to look inside masonry walls and understand how those walls were constructed internally. So microwave radar can show us the construction materials that are inside our, our walls. We can detect steel and other metals. You can detect potential threats such as voids and cracks in the walls. These voids and cracks, with some years of experience interpreting radar data, you can then interpret the, the images that, that come out of the radar device as irregularities, meaning voids inside walls. So once the data is analyzed, a view of the current internal situation can be asserted. And after repair activities are finished, the radar is again used to show the repair's level of success. And so what we are showing here are two typical radar scans as the radar antenna is moved down the wall. This is the output. So on the left, before an intervention, this scan is showing us multiple voids inside the masonry wall. We like our walls to be solid, and we devised an injection repair approach to fill those voids. And after the voids were repaired, we again used radar as a form of uh, quality assurance to make sure that these voids were filled. And in this case, the, the radar trace shows almost completely solid wall. Very, very good level of success with this repair. So, in addition to radar, we sometimes use fiber optic techniques that allow us to actually look inside the wall with our own eyes. We may use um, uh, boroscopes or fiber optic video scopes to uh, look inside walls. And the top right image here is showing the inside of a historic masonry wall. We see brick, mortar, and a void space that was detected with radar. Another technology that we use to gather information on historic masonry is infrared thermography. You know infrared cameras, they take a, 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 a and they can produce an image of the heat output at the surface of walls. Infrared thermography is the technique of measuring this level of infrared, infrared light detected throughout an object, often depicting that data as an image. So, this too can be very helpful when spotting voids or locating the sources of moisture infiltration. This series of images on the right shows the stone pattern and the mortar joints between stones that are completely hidden by plaster. So again, it's a technique that allows us to look inside walls and not remove historic materials to determine the original construction. Another evaluation technique is ultrasonic velocity testing. This type of NDE is conducted by introducing a small ultrasonic energy into the historic masonry and then measuring the sound waves as they travel. It is somewhat of a time-consuming effort, but it offers a method to gain additional understanding of the current internal construction an internal condition of a structure. In this case, we were checking for damage at the interior of this brick pier. Now, NDE tests are very good. They give us good information on construction, but engineers need to have information on strength and stiffness of materials. So to do this, there are many in-place test methods to give the historic preservation teams more information with which to develop a repair or strengthening plan. So we see here some typical depictions of anchor bolt tests, testing for tension, the strength of anchors in tension or in shear. Uh, flatjack methods are a very, very powerful tool which allow us to test the compressive strength of the masonry in place in the wall. There's no need.
giving the designer data for engineering analysis. Now, some tests are very simple. The pendulum hammer test, for example, is a variation of the Schmidt hammer test developed for evaluating concrete. And this method measures the mortar hardness by gauging the resistance of a hammer pressing onto a mortar joint. An example of where you might use this test would be finding areas where mortar has been softened or deteriorated by weathering. And mortar replacement and, and the process of repointing mortar joints can be minimized by careful evaluation of mortar joints using this method. The ASTM C1601 test is a water penetration evaluation that is often called a storm in a box. Essentially, a box is anchored to the face of a masonry wall. And this box forces water towards the wall under a simulated wind pressure. It's a very severe test. The amount of water that is up, absorbed by the wall over time is calculated and used as a definitive measurement of the wall's water penetration resistance. We often use this test to quantify the effect of injection repairs for solving moisture penetration issues. For example, this graph shows data from two tests. Before the repair method, we had a very high rate of water infiltration. And after injection, some 95% reduction in the amount of water that has been absorbed by the wall, thus proving the effectiveness of the injection-based repair. Okay, so those are evaluation techniques. Now we get to some repair technologies. We first got our start um, almost 25 years ago looking at uh, injection techniques for strengthening and stabilizing historic masonry. We use a technique and, a met and materials that we call compatible injected fill, or CIL. This is not an epoxy material. It is typically a cement-based or a lime-based material, and it is engineered to be compatible to the host structure, be very similar to the mortar and the old historic bricks. The CAF is injected under low pressure into cracks and voids in historic masonry. And it's a very effective technique for repairing the types of conditions that we see here cracked brick and internal voids. The pockets of air and cracks are filled by this liquid compatible injection material that then hardens and bonds to the existing masonry making it very solid and strong. So this photo shows an example of a wall with voids and cracks that will be repaired by CIF injection. And, and here's an image of the inside of a wall where CIF has filled the voids between the brick and the stone. It's this darker gray material that has been injected and is solidly bonding then the facing brick to the stone. And we have, uh, we brought with us, we can pass this around, it's just a core sample that was removed from one of our repair projects um, that shows a real life example of, of how injection works at filling voids and cracks. You can see, as you look at this, um, the injected material very effective at filling in voids and bonding to the uh, brickwork. Just pass it around. So, here's an illustration that illustrates how CIF injection enhances the structural behavior of historic mason. By injecting internal voids with CIF compatible injected fill, we force all the layers of the wall to work together in resisting loads, as shown on the left. We want all of the layers of the wall to work together. With internal voids, the wall
with a fabric sock. This sock helps to confine the injected cement based grout and keep it from uh, uh, keep it in the vicinity of that anchor. Now, in the same way that anchors can be added to enhance the geometry of a building's connections, geometry can also enhance the anchor's strength. And this is a really a fabulous technology that, that has been developed recently. It's the ability to drill holes that aren't straight. The holes are tapered. Okay, are this undercut tapered anchor connection provides a very high tension value to the anchor in a short embedment plane, much shorter than you would have with a straight anchor embedment. So you can see that this core hole has a taper, a flare at the bottom. It's a, it's a really unique technology for drilling holes. And we have a, a nice little demonstration. We'll pass this around. And, and, and this, this plastic shape has a, a, a inside of it an undercut anchor. So you can see a very slight, about a 10 degree taper to this, this connection. Now, here's our anchor. We put this in a hole. Um, if this were a straight anchorage, you could, you could pull this rod out right away. We're going to use a material with, with essentially zero strength. This is salt, you know, powder material placed into the hole. Um, it's the geometry of this tapered connection that provides the strength. And I know, I know students are very strong, you know how to break things, but try very hard to pull this out. It's the geometry and the taper of this connection that makes it work. Yeah, don't tip it upside down or the saw will run up, but you can look at it and, and play with it. So a demonstration now, it, 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 you can see this firsthand, it's very effective way of, of providing anchorage in historic construction. It's just salt in there, it won't hurt you. <laughs> okay, now to strengthen buildings for seismic events, or for typhoons, or high winds, reinforcement can be added internally in our historic walls by drilling deep distances within a historic wall and placing vertical steel and sometimes horizontal steel. This steel is attached to footings by using an undercut drill and injecting the steel and its attachments within the wall. You see here plan views of some different situation where vertical steel is being added inside historic masonry construction. So, we have drilled into walls to place this reinforcement, sometimes over 65 meters long. The technique requires very special equipment, but more importantly, experienced workers who are careful not to damage the historic fabric of the building. Now, many times there are other materials such as wood, cast iron, and steel that are within the masonry and may also need Repair. There are special techniques available to restore and enhance those materials also. And it's not the focus of today's presentation, but you understand that there are techniques to determine the material characteristics of wood. And once you can understand those characteristics and diagnose problems, the proper repair can be determined. determined. Um, and just as an introduction to another very effective technique, uh, uh, let's think about corrosion of metals inside masonry walls. Steel corrosion is an electrochemical process. And by utilizing a tiny voltage and current and injecting compatible materials to surround any metal that may be present in an historic masonry wall, this corrosion can be stopped and the process of that corrosion can be stabilized. This method is very useful for halting corrosion of structural steel embedded in masonry and concrete without demolition and rebuilding. 
I think finally, um, I want to talk to you about uh, a seismic strengthening system. And some of our anchors are designed with specific problems in mind. For example, this modulock system uses a special connector. This connector is installed within the historic masonry wall and provides that connection between the wall and the floor or the roof diaphragm. Working with vertical post-tension rods, this modular connector helps to dissipate earthquake energy, and this reduces earthquake damage to historic masonry walls. Now that we all understand the philosophy and technology, let's take a look at some examples where some of these solutions have been used. Hurricane Typhoon Katrina hit the city of New Orleans on the 29th of August, 2005. It was a Category 3 hurricane with wind surge over 200 kilometers per hour. It created a storm surge and flooding in areas in New Orleans. New Orleans, after all, is three meters below sea level. So the city is shaped like a bowl, and the depth of the bowl is three meters below sea level. There were over 1,800 deaths and damage to the property of over 500 billion RMB. The storm, the storm revealed the weakness in the city's levee and pumping system, so many historic pumping stations that keep New Orleans from flooding needed enhancement to resist future hurricanes. This is a scene of the Ninth Ward in New Orleans, and you can see it was catastrophic as uh, this is very close to where the uh, levee was Breach. Challenges of diagnosis and quality control of the enhancement program were really threefold. Our job was to determine the existing problems with masonry buildings, which dated from 1890, and find the damaged areas and provide construction testing for verification for the program's success as a form of quality assurance. To determine the existing conditions and test the distressed areas, pre-construction testing obtained useful information and data about the existing structures, data which informed the design of the compatible injected fill. Flat jack testing determines the compressive strength of the existing masonry in place. It is uh, non-destructive and provides data critical for engineering analysis and repair design. Utilizing an analytical approach, components are carefully positioned to achieve maximum utility while being concealed from view. We used a series of methods to strengthen these walls. Here we have the hollow anchors being injected from the top of the walls. Now what we're looking at here is a stainless uh, steel hollow anchor. By the way, the, the stainless steel came from China. So whenever you see pictures of New Orleans, take pride in the fact that China is protecting New Orleans now. Um, but here we have the, the anchors being injected. Now these anchors, in this particular instance, are seven meters, uh, seven meters long, and then they're tapered with another device at the bottom of that seven meters. To give you some idea, what is this room? About 10 or 12 meters wide. So this is, this is a, a pretty long uh, boring. And here's the vertical layout of the anchorage. We can see here, this is at the top of the wall. And here we see the, the anchors at the top of the wall, here and here and here. Been, a portion of the roof has been removed, and the, uh, the cooring equipment has been set up to drill down that depth. There will be, 
here are the totals of the enhancement uh, components for the Heritage New Orleans pumping station project. Now this is one project actually. All of this was accomplished while the stations were still operating. There were huge pumps in these stations because remember they're keeping New Orleans dry and so there was really no other way to uh, repair and enhance these walls. Nothing could be done from the inside for lack of room and of course we needed to keep the aesthetics of the original building on the exterior. Michael, would you take this one? Oh. <laughs> we have more talk, we can continue the demonstration. <laughs> Thank you. 